And uh, let's uh, start with a quick review of uh, last lecture. So last time, uh, we talked about lasers. We learned about lasers specifically, uh, well, the, la the lasing principle. And then specifically, we looked at solid uh, uh, semiconductor laser diodes, or solid state lasers, that are uh, the type of lasers that are used in LIDARs. And uh, then we started talking about uh, the, the characteristics of these beams of light that uh, are, are emitted. Uh, from lasers. Uh, so uh, the, the physical description uh, basically uh, uh, uses this idea of the, the, the paraxial uh, wave approximation. And the idea here is that, uh, and, and this is general, uh, like this is general, you know, wave uh, physics uh, or, 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 or um, optics, uh, that any uh, focused optical beam uh, if you look uh, uh, far down the axis of propagation, uh, it can be approximate, uh, approximated as uh, a, what is called a paraxial wave. Um, so if, say, uh, uh, you take the z-axis as the uh, optical axis of, the, of, of propagation, if you look far down the z-axis, and, and, and just around, you know, the, 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 uh, the z-axis, so when z is much, much bigger than x and y, uh, you basically can approximate any focused beam or the electric field uh, associated with it as uh, some uh, envelope term. Uh, so this is some general function, u of x, y, and z. Okay, uh, that's, that's the envelope term. Uh, so that determines basically how um, the, the, the power is distributed uh, as a function of a, x, y, and z, times a uh, plane wave term. And this is a plane wave that has a wave vector that points in the z direction. So that's why instead of e to the minus j k dot r, we just get norm k times z, because that inner product when, when k is pointing in the z direction just becomes norm k uh, times, uh, times z. Okay, so this is general. And then specifically, uh, if, if, if uh, you look at the focused beams that are emitted uh, from uh, lasers, um, it turns out that this envelope uh, becomes a Gaussian function, um, or is very, I should say, very well approximated by a Gaussian function. Again, this is, a, uh, this is an approximate solution, but a very, very good approximation. Um, so in that case, uh, we basically have an envelope that is a Gaussian function, and hence these waves are called Gaussian beams, or the beams of light that are emitted by the lasers, they're called uh, Gaussian beams. And, and, and this should be familiar because, again, if you shine any laser, like, like a laser pointer, on a flat surface, like a wall or a piece of paper, you see this intensity pattern that is actually a Gaussian function. It's bright in the center, and then it, it, it uh, uh, gradually tapers off as you radially move away from the, from the optical center. Um, so uh, the formulation is this, so that envelope term uh, for lasers uh, is given by this complex valued Gaussian function, 1 plus uh, z over jb, uh, z plus jb times e to the minus j times the wave number, which is norm of k, times x squared plus y squared divided by 2z plus jb. So here you immediately see the symmetry with respect to x, y. So the, the only place where you have x and y is in this x squared plus y squared, which is the radial dif uh, distance from uh, the optical axis, right? If this is your z um, axis, uh, x squared, uh, any, any point that is on a circle, and this circle is perpendicular, this is a poor drawing, but the idea is this is perpendicular to z, that has uh, x squared plus y squared that is a constant, right? Um, so, so, so that, that uh, you should uh, kind of see the radial symmetry there, which is expected of a, of a 2D Gaussian. And, uh, from this envelope, uh, uh, so uh, if, if you, for instance, um, from this find the, uh, the plane or the z value at which uh, the, the, the uh, uh, waste size of this Gaussian, is, is, uh, this Gaussian envelope is minimized, it turns out to be at z equals zero. Okay, so that's called the beam waste. And if you look at the envelope function at, at that, uh, so you basically just plug in z equals zero into your, your, your equation up above, uh, your envelope just becomes one over jb times e to the minus x squared plus y squared divided by w zero squared, where w zero is just this new variable we have introduced uh, to clean up the notation a little bit, uh, but it's equal to the square root of lambda times b over pi. 
And uh, W0 is called the beam waste radius, okay? So specifically, what is that? So if you look at the, um, basically, if I plot the, um, uh, the envelope or the, or the uh, um, um, basically amplitude of the field at, at the z equals zero plane. Um, so you get this, and I'm just gonna uh, draw a cross section of it. So you're gonna get this basically Gaussian pattern. Um, so, so this is our basically z axis. And I'm, I'm just doing a cross section here. So plotting the, so, so I'm just, this is a slightly confusing plot, but I'm looking at the, amplitude of the field at the z equals zero um, plane. Uh, so it's a Gaussian function. And uh, what W0 is, is the, is the radial distance from the optical axis at which the field amplitude drops by one over E. Okay, because if you plug in x squared plus y squared equals W0 squared, you just get one over E this becomes e to the minus one, which is one over e. So, so that's uh, kind of uh, taken as the, as the radius. So it's not like the field drops to zero at w zero. Uh, it, it's, it's a Gaussian function, so it just continuously goes on um, for any value. But uh, most of the energy is basically contained within a radius of of W0 at the, at the focus. Now, um, this also, uh, we showed that uh, there's um, a couple of important parameters you can extract from this uh, formulation. Uh, one is, um, let's go to the slide there. Uh, the, so, so we looked at the focus plane just now. And at the focus plane, again, if you put a flat surface there, you would see this, this 2D uh, circular Gaussian function with a radius, or a one over E radius, I should say, of, of uh, W0. Um, but the, the beam doesn't uh, stay at a constant uh, uh, waste radius, uh, at, at a constant radius. So it diverges as it goes past the focus point. That's, that's the characteristic of any focus beam. Uh, so the, the, the wave fronts become uh, convex and it starts diverging. How fast does it diverge? Uh, we can calculate the uh, beam radius, this W of Z, which is the beam radius. Um, or I should say the one over E beam radius. So it's, it's again the radius at which the beam uh, amplitude drops by a factor of one over E as a function of Z. So Z equals zero again is our uh, uh, focus plane. And as you go in the positive uh, uh, Z direction, as the wave propagates, you start to diverge. And this is the exact expression for uh, basically that, that, that radius. And uh, as you see, uh, there's a couple of interesting things here. One is, of course, it's, it's, it is diverging. So Z is in the numerator here, right? so it does diverge. But how quickly uh, does it diverge? Well, it depends on uh, how tightly we focus the beam. Because you see this W0 squared is in the denominator here. So the smaller uh, you focus your beam, uh, the faster it is going to diverge as it, as, it, as it propagates. Specifically, you can, you can find this divergence angle theta d, and uh, the derivation is in the notes, but it turns out that theta d is very well approximated by lambda over pi times w0, okay? So again, smaller w0 means a smaller focus makes theta larger, which means faster divergence, okay? Another thing uh, which I find interesting is this lambda in the, in the numerator. Uh, so uh, that also means, uh, well, first it, it kind of uh, uh, um, uh, tells this, this uh, trade-off that we have seen also in millimeter wave radar and also in sonar that if you want a more focused beam, you have to go to higher frequencies, right? Higher frequencies, in this case, we know frequency is speed of light over lambda, so higher frequency uh, means uh, uh, basically uh, smaller, smaller lambdas. And here, smaller lambda means better uh, or uh, better uh, collimation, so you can stay uh, more collimated or you would have a smaller divergence angle at smaller wavelengths, 
Okay, so that's that. And then uh, this, this R of Z parameter, um, we're uh, not gonna use it much, but uh, just so you know, it is the, uh, the radius of curvature of the face front. So as, as, as we said, as you go past the focus point, the, the wave front or the face fronts become uh, convex and the actual radius of curvature of that is, is, is given at a, at a plane, at, 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 uh, at, at a point Z is given uh, by this RFC uh, parameter. Okay, so one thing, uh, if, if you plug in uh, some, some typical numbers, so uh, say you have a semiconductor laser, and these devices, as we said, are very small, so typically uh, the, the, the beam waste radius of a laser beam coming directly out of a diode, uh, laser diode is, is microns. It's, it could be like 10 microns, 15, 20. It's, it's on that order, okay? So it's tens of microns. Uh, so the W zeros that, that, that you work with is gonna be uh, tens of micrometers, okay? And say your wavelength is uh, like 15, 15 nanometers. Lambda is, excuse me, uh, with a lambda of um, 15, 15 nanometers. If you plug in those numbers and calculate your divergence angle, you, you come up with very large divergence angles, tens of degrees typically, like it could be 20, 30, up to 50 degrees. And um, if you remember, I, I, I brought a uh, fiber coppered laser last time and we actually checked it on a piece of paper. It was diverging so quickly that a few inches away, the beam diameter or the beam radius was so large that it was obvious it's not using for sensing applications like LiDAR because for LiDAR you want a beam that stays very narrow, nicely collimated for uh, many, many, many meters, like hundreds of meters you want a, a, a beam. So what can we do? Well, that's why we need um, optics, and by optics we mean lens elements because what a lens does, it basically transforms the beam waste uh, radius for you from um, some input number W0 to an output that could be much larger. Specifically, for instance, uh, again, we experimented with um, one lens, and I'm going to just bring up the data sheet of the lens we looked at. So uh, it was a, uh, this is the data sheet of the actual uh, lens that we used. It actually is a doublet lens, so it has two lens elements of, uh, inside it. Um, so uh, if you look at the data sheet, uh, it, this lens was designed for 15, 15 nanometers. We tested it with a le red laser, which is a uh, shorter wavelength. So it didn't work quite perfectly, but still did a, did a good job. And as part of the data sheet, uh, there's this design MFD. MFD stands for mode field diameter. So it's basically uh, two times W0 at the input to the lens. And this one you see it's 10.4 microns, which actually matches the uh, diameter of the fiber that that uh, that laser was 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 coupled to. So that's at the input to the lens, and then it gives you the output one over e squared beam diameter. Uh, we said one over e. Why do you guys say one over e squared? Because they're talking about intensity instead of field, and we know intensity is the square of the field. So same thing, uh, but that's the output beam diameter. So that's two w zero at the output of the, of, the, of the lens. And you see it goes from 10 microns to seven millimeters. So that's, that's, that's the, basically the main effect of, of having a lens in the optical path. And now if you uh, basically calculate the divergence angle at the output of the lens, plugging in your lambda, which is 15, 15 nanometers, and your omega zero, uh, which is now uh, 3.5 millimeters, uh, so your theta d, and you can check this number, comes out to be 0 0.016 degrees, very small divergence angle, right? So now this beam is going to stay nice and collimated for hundreds of meters, and it's very useful for um, sensing applications. Um, okay, so, so hopefully this justifies why uh, why lenses are needed and what actually we achieve with them. Uh, then the question is, okay, so what is, what is uh, the right uh, beam diameter to use for, for, for LIDARs? And uh, it is a design parameter that needs to be optimized according to the application, okay? So here's one example, and again, these, this, is, this is just one specific example. For any application, you need to go through the exercise and see what the right uh, beam diameter is. But let's say you want to design a, a LiDAR that uh, is supposed to um, 
work up to 400 meters. And then for your application, you want your beam um, uh, radius to be smaller than 50 millimeters at 400 meters, okay? Where did that number come from? Well, somebody decided that uh, because beam, beam size essentially uh, is, is one of the main factors that determines the uh, resolution of your point cloud, right? Like that's, that's like the pixel size, if you will, in a, in a point cloud. So somebody decided 50 millimeter is a, is a radius uh, that, that is required at 400 meters. And then the question is, what beam size should we use um, at the transmitter to achieve this? So the way you can solve this is, is basically we have the expression which gives us the W of Z, which is the beam radius as a function of Z. And uh, you can plot that for different values of W0, the, the waist diameter, okay? You can start with no optics and just straight out of the laser. Let's say your laser has a 5.2 micron uh, waist diameter. Uh, so if you don't put any lens, then you can plot it as a function of Z. And that gives you this blue curve here. Um, and notice that uh, the x-axis here is logarithmic. So this one very quickly blows up. I mean, at, at one meter away from your, your, your laser, you're already way above the requirement, which was 50 millimeters in diameter. So that, of course, doesn't work. Then you start, you know, sweeping your, your W until you found a value that is, that is satisfactory. And in this case, at four millimeters, uh, seems to be uh, meeting the, the design criteria. So that, that gives us the green curve, which at 400 meters, so this is 400 meters, uh, is, is just below the 50 micron um, requirement um, that, that is needed. So basically, for this application, your collimated beam at the transmitter needs to have a radius of uh, four millimeters or larger. Okay, larger also works, we know. Um, but that's, that's kind of the minimum is, is four millimeters. And then from there, uh, you can do some math and find the, basically what is the focal length that, that you need to get this collimation. And then you can go browse basically, um, um, uh, there's vendors who have catalogs of lenses and you can find a lens or a lens assembly that, that basically gives you the beam diameter that you need with the focal length that you need. So that's, that's basically how the optomechanical design for LiDAR works. Okay, any questions? All right, so um, let's talk a little more about atmospheric effects on, um, on, on, on laser beam propagation. So there are two main atmospheric effects um, when it comes to um, um, beam propagation. First one we have already looked at, and that's absorption. We know, you know at different wavelengths, there's different uh, absorption factors in the atmosphere. Uh, and it also changes with you know, the atmospheric conditions. If there's more moisture in the atmosphere, you know, typically it gets worse. Um, and then there is the second one, which we're going to talk about now, which is a scattering. So scattering is basically if a collimated beam hits a particle as it's traveling, um, part of its energy is going to randomly scatter in different directions. Now, the scattering behavior highly depends on the ratio of the aerosol size, called that D, so those are the dimensions of these particles in the atmosphere, to the wavelength lambda. Specifically, uh, you can be in one of the three regimes. If the aerosols are much, much smaller than, than your wavelength, that puts you in the so-called Rayleigh scattering regime. And that's, for instance, what makes the sky blue. Uh, the reason the sky is blue is because of the Rayleigh scattering that's, that's happening in the atmosphere. Then you can be in the regime where your uh, aerosols dimensions and the wavelength are roughly on the same order. That puts you in the so-called Mie scattering regime. And that's, for instance, is the, is the effect that makes the uh, clouds white. Okay, so clouds have bigger water particles in them than, um, you know, pure atmosphere, and then uh, that, that makes uh, me scattering happening inside the clouds. And finally, you can be in a regime where your aerosol dimensions are much, much larger than your wavelength, and that puts you in the so-called geometric scattering regime, and that's what uh, makes rainbows, basically. Um, so you see, it's, you can have very different physics depending on uh, this ratio of, of, of uh, uh, d, d to lambda. Now, it also turns out that um, not only you can get slightly different physics, uh, but also the strength of these effects are, are, are vastly different. So specifically, me scattering is a much, much stronger scattering effect than Rayleigh scattering. And by much, much stronger, I mean by many orders of magnitude. 
And this can become a big problem for LIDAR. Uh, so let's look at an example. So let's say you have fog in the atmosphere. And fog particles typically have diameters of about like 10 to 50 microns. OK. Now in this atmosphere, if you want to operate a LIDAR with a wavelength of 1.5 microns or 15, 15 nanometers, that puts the LIDAR roughly in the mean scattering regime. It's roughly on the same order as D. Lambda and D are, are, are kind of close. OK. But in the same atmosphere, if you operate a 77 gigahertz radar, as we know, the wavelength of the radar is 3.9 millimeters or 3,900 microns. So that's much larger than the, than the aerosol dimensions and puts the radar in the Rayleigh scattering regime. Now we just said that mean scattering is a much, much stronger effect than Rayleigh scattering. And that's why typically LIDAR gets degraded or the LIDAR performance gets degraded uh, much more than radar when it comes to you know, poor atmospheric conditions like rain and fog and things like that. Okay, um, so, so that's just one thing to note. And that's why, again, generally LIDAR is much more susceptible to atmospheric effects than, than radar. Um, so when it comes to mean scattering, which is the main kind of scattering that affects LIDAR performance, uh, it actually hurts the LIDAR performance in two different ways. OK, so let's look at the pictures here. Here we are showing a Gaussian beam traveling left to right. OK, and then as it's traveling, it hits some, uh, uh, some aerosol, uh, shown in blue here, and then mean scattering happens. OK, so um, as I said, when scattering happens, uh, the scattered energy can, can go in any, any uh, direction, basically. So we can have back scattering, so some of that energy scatters backwards, basically towards the, the transmitter. And you can also have forward scattering in, in different angles. Uh, now, here you see the two effects, because if you had some target here, well, first, because of the scattering, some of the transmitted light would not hit the target, right? It just gets scattered in random directions, wouldn't make its way to the target. So that would reduce the SNR, because now less of your transmitted light is, is going to make it uh, or, or be incident on the target. So naturally, you get less echo or, or reflected light back. So that's the first thing that uh, degrades the performance with the mean scattering. But also, some of these backscattered light can make its way back to the receiver and show as real targets, right? Uh, especially if it's strong enough, which happens when the particles are smaller. Smaller particles typically give more, more backscattering than larger particles. So some of that backscattered light would show as false positives in the detector. So you see there's 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 two effects really happening here. Um, so here's just a, a picture showing, like, again, you have your LIDAR um, operating in fog or rain or, you know, some uh, highly scattering medium. Uh, and then the two effects that hurt you, like some of these um, um, scattering events would, would have backscatter that makes it, its way back to the, to the LIDAR, and that would show as false positives. But also you would have, because of all the energy that got scattered away randomly throughout this atmosphere, naturally you get less light incident on the target, which reduces your SNR. So basically, to summarize, SNR goes down, false positive goes up when, um, when you have a multiple scattering medium for LiDAR. Um, here's uh, one experiment we ran um, to, to kind of quantify this effect. So in this experiment, um, it's, it's, uh, it's in a room, and, and we have a target. It's just a mannequin that is set in the room. And we have a fog machine. So we can kind of, in a semi-controlled way, generate uh, fog with different, different densities inside the room. Uh, left column shows uh, basically a camera looking into the room. And right, right column shows point clouds from a LIDAR that is looking into uh, the same room. And in this case, we were using a Velodyne VLP32C LIDAR. When uh, first, a uh, top row is uh, when you have light fog. OK, so there's, as you see in the camera view, there's a little bit of fog. Um, so that's why you have reduced contrast on the target, but not too dense. OK, and then uh, you, get, uh, you look at your uh, LIDAR point cloud. It's mostly fine, but you do get a little bit of false positives. You see like these floating particles that are detected uh, in midair, those are from backscattered light. Uh, causing some false positives. But it's mostly OK. I mean, it's not, it's not horrible. 
But then as you increase your fog density, if you go to a heavy fog case, well, camera gets completely impaired almost, right? You can't make out the target. Uh, LiDAR also is now uh, heavily impaired. Uh, as you see, you get uh, very high false positives. Almost, it's almost like the wall is, is just you know, continuing across. There's no opening. You still have some detections on your target, but with much reduced SNR. And as you can see, this, this can then become a real problem because then in such cases in your LiDAR map, uh, your false positives look like real obstacles, right? So this is a challenging case where, where um, basically if you were to do autonomy in such a case, in such a you know, condition, um, and camera is not much help, right? LiDAR is really, really, really degraded. So this is a case where you would need to, for instance, heavily rely on your radar, which wouldn't get uh, um, degraded in, 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 in such, a, such a scenario. And this kind of illustrate, illustrates why you need complementarity of, of different sensing modalities. There are, I should say, uh, things you can do to um, reject uh, some of these false positive detections in LIDARs. Uh, and with smarter, you know, signal processing algorithms, but uh, none of the radars out in the market today do those. Um, so pretty much like any 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 off-the-shelf uh, lidar you buy, this is the kind of behavior you would get from them in in um, uh, poor atmospheric conditions. Any questions? Okay. Uh, let's continue. So, um, as we said, um, when it comes to illuminating the scene, there is there is two uh, uh, basically uh, main techniques that lidars use. Uh, one was flash lidar, which was exactly like flash photography. In one shot, basically, they generate very wide beams of of, of laser. So those do not use. Gaussian beams, essentially, they actually put, instead of uh, collimating optics, they use diffusing optics, uh, which are these diffusing elements that generate very wide beams so they can illuminate the entire scene in one shot. Um, but most of the LIDARs actually use Gaussian beams, and then they have beam scanning uh, mechanisms that just scan this pencil beam uh, across some field of view, and then uh, that's how uh, they illuminate the scene. So I want to talk a little bit about different beam scanning techniques. So there are two main categories of, of beam scanning techniques. Uh, when it comes to LIDARs. Uh, first one is solid state uh, beam scanning. So solid state beam scanners are basically techniques that um, pretty much don't have big uh, moving mechanical parts, okay? That's mainly what distinguishes them. So those are things like uh, MEMS mirror arrays, liquid crystal arrays, optical phase arrays, and electro-optical beam scanners. Uh, these are very attractive technologies, again, because they can be very compact, very low power and uh, uh, very robust because they don't have big moving parts. But as of today, um, most of these technologies are not quite mature for you know, widespread field deployment. They are deployed you know, in, in, in limited cases, but they're mostly still under development for, for LIDAR. I'm sure um, soon enough we'll, we'll get them, uh, you know, get to the maturity level that we'll see more of those. But as of today, most of the beam scanning techniques that are used are not, in LIDARs, are not, are not solid state. They're actually mechanical uh, beam scanning techniques. So mechanical beam scanning, as the name suggests, these have you know, big moving mechanical parts uh, that are used uh, to scan the beam. And uh, there's two types of them. Either, um, basically, the entire you know, transmitter with the laser and everything is moved. You know, you fix the laser to a frame and just move that frame. Um, things like rotating frame uh, beam scanners do that, which is extremely common. Or you have some sort of optical elements like prisms or mirrors in the path of the laser beam and move those elements to scan the beam. So you can have things like uh, prism scanners, galvo mirror scanners, or electrostatic or polygon mirror, as, as we'll see. Okay. So let's look at some examples, some pictures mostly, to, so you get more familiar with both the solid state and mechanical beam scanners. Uh, here are some uh, pictures of solid state beam, uh, beam scanners. So um, top left is a MEMS scanner. Okay, so, uh, so you have your mirror at the center, 
and then you have some electrostatic actuators, exactly basically same uh, type of architecture that we saw in uh, gyroscopes and accelerometers. You have these you know, comb drive actuators basically that um, actuate the, the, generate some movement and then they can uh, uh, basically move the mirror in a, 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 in a, and generate some pitch and roll. And so your mirror can move in two axes, and then you have some uh, incident beam, which is fixed, and then the output beam basically is scanned in two axes as the mirror uh, uh, pivots. Then you can have your liquid crystal scanner. So liquid crystal is, uh, uh, it has a uh, basically, basically LCD array, liquid crystal array. And uh, the liquid crystal, by controlling the phase of the pixels inside the liquid crystal array, you can deflect the beam in, 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 in different directions. Uh, interesting technology, but uh, it can be lossy and it can generate side lobes, so your outgoing beam can, might not be a nice Gaussian anymore, and it can be slow. So those are the reasons, and this is all today, right? I mean, these are not fundamental limitations of the technology, but this is why, why it's not widely deployed today. Um, about MEMS, uh, what are the limitations of MEMS today? Well, uh, one is the size of the mirrors. I mean, you know, MEMS devices are, you know, very small scale devices. So this mirror, um, these tend to be very small. So you can have like a, I don't know, giant, you know, five, four or five millimeter beam just hitting one mirror. You can make a, a mirror array um, and, and, you know, scan all of them together. Um, but then that also there's a limit to, you know, how well you can synchronize all of those mirrors. And also um, there's some uh, mechanical reliability issues with these MEMS uh, scanners today, specifically for, um, you know, applica robotic applications where uh, robustness uh, is, is key, like automotive applications, these are, these are not a great fit as of today. Then you can have electro-optical scanners. So uh, these use electro-optical effects. Uh, typically you have two electrodes on the device. One controls in-phase, uh, sorry, in-plane angle, uh, and, and the other one uh, controls out-of-plane. You can think of it as azimuth and elevation control for the outgoing beam. And uh, typically the way they work is that by applying these voltages to the electrodes, Electrodes, they modulate the a refractive index of the medium that the light is traveling through, and by doing that, you can deflect light in different different directions. So you have a fixed input beam and a scanned output beam, basically, out of those devices. And finally, you can have optical phase array scanners. Um, extremely attractive technology, uh, not super mature today, but uh, the core idea here is exactly like phased array radar that we looked at. If you remember with phased array radar, we said if you have multiple antennas um, that, that are transmitting, uh, by applying a relative phase between those antennas, you can basically uh, deflect uh, the effective outgoing uh, radar beam in different directions, you can do exact same idea in optics. I mean, this is the same physics, right? It's electromagnetic waves. So the way this works, except this works at much smaller scales because wavelengths are much smaller. So you have your incoming, um, basically that's, that's your uh, laser diode. It's coupled to a waveguide coming in, so this is all on, a, say, a silicon wafer. And then you split that into, you know, multiple waveguides. Okay, um, so that's this, you know, tree structure. It's just like splitting the light. And then you have a bunch of phase modulators in the path of each of these waveguides. And then you can control the, 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 the uh, phases uh, or the delays of these individual uh, waveguides. And then uh, at the output, you kind of bring them together, right, um, very closely. And then that becomes your essentially output aperture. And then by controlling the phases, you can scan the outgoing beam in different directions. OK, so that's, uh, that's solid state. Now let's look at uh, some mechanical beam scanning techniques. And again, today, uh, most of the LIDARs you see use, use mechanical beam scanners. Um, I'm, I'm sure it will change. Eventually, solid state will, will become the dominant technology. But that's not the case today. So. Uh, Specifically, most of the LIDARs uh, today uh, use this uh, rotating frame mechanical uh, beam scanner. It's a, it's a pretty simple mechanical architecture. So basically, uh, they have multiple lasers inside, 
Okay, so that's why in this picture you see, you know, there is there's multiple laser beams coming out. Each is from a individual laser diode, and each is pointing into a fixed elevation angle. Okay, so the elevation angles of the outgoing beams are just fixed um, by construction, and uh, you can have I've seen any number between 16 and 128 outgoing beams. Of course, more means you get, you know, uh, better elevation resolution. And then the entire frame uh, where the, these lasers and the corresponding photo detectors are mounted uh, basically rotates. So it's, it, it has a motor that, that rotates the whole thing uh, full 360 degrees. Um, and it can go at angular velocities minimum as 10 hertz but some of them go faster, 15, 20, 30 hertz. And that's how you get these ring-like scan patterns. So essentially, each if, like, if you look at the, these, that's the point cloud shown around the car. The LiDAR is mounted at the top of the car. And then you have these you know, beams coming out. And each beam, as rotates, it just scans like a circle around the, around the LiDAR. So that's how you get you know, these ring-like patterns. And uh, as, as you see, uh, the result is you get, uh, you know, very good resolution on each ring in, uh, uh, in azimuth, right? Uh, but elevation is, is, is pretty coarse and discrete, and, and that's determined by the number of beams that you have and how they're placed. Um, there's different strategies for, you know, uh, pointing the or deciding the elevation angles of the outgoing beams. Some, some LIDARs do uniform. Some of them uh, have some gradient. Like this is a specific one. Uh, you see it, it's, it's denser. Uh, towards the horizon because this was optimized for driving applications where you know most of the interesting stuff is on the road and mostly at, at you know at, at horizon level so it gets a little coarser in elevation above horizon and also below horizon it's a little coarser anyway so this is this is one of the dominant ways there there are other techniques uh, this next one is a is a pretty interesting like from a Engineering and scientific point of view, I, I find it fascinating, but practically it's kind of questionable, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why. But uh, it's called Risley prisms. I think it was developed by Lockheed Martin, and uh, it was used in some early LIDARs and fighter jets. It's a very cool idea. So there is some incident beam coming at an, um, uh, on an optical axis, and then they have two... Uh, round prisms which have wedge-like uh, cross-sections. So that's prism one, that's prism two, and then if you look at the cross-section of the two, you see they're like wedges, okay? So um, just by the effect of uh, uh, refracting the light, so the incident beam, it basically uh, gets refracted twice, uh, once as it enters each prism and once as it exits, okay? Um, and, then, and then it uh, goes out at some angle, and then by rotating the two, two prisms, so the two prisms are mounted on you know, rotating frames, so they can rotate about the optical axis of the system at different, uh, different angular velocities, omega one and omega two. So by just controlling the, the ratio of omega one and omega two, you can generate different scan patterns of the outgoing beam. Um, so here are two examples. Uh, they're these like Rosetta-like patterns uh, that you get. So uh, if you have a ratio of two to one, uh, uh, you get this. If you have a ratio of 10 to 1, you get the more dense looking uh, pattern. Um, so it's pretty cool. And there is at least one LiDAR company called Livox that, that, that uses this. Um, but the scan patterns are kind of irregular, right? And um, you have some control over it, but it's, 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 it's weird the way you control it. Like you can't have regular, you know, grid like um, uh, scan patterns that are more desirable typically. So you kind of, you get what you get. But it's an interesting technology. Um, and then uh, you can have mechanical scanners that uh, just use mirrors, basically. So you put a mirror in the path, or one or a few mirrors in the path of the laser beam, and move the mirrors to scan uh, the beam. So here's the electrostatic scanner. You have this round gold-plated uh, gold mirror. Uh, you have your input beam and output beam. And then there's electrostatic actuators that basically uh, 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 move the mirror or uh, uh, pivot the mirror about two axes. 
and then you can have a two-axis beam scanner. Um, these are uh, uh, highly configurable, right? Because uh, uh, depending on like what waveform you send to the X and Y actuators, um, you can generate different output scan patterns. Um, so they're highly flexible in terms of scan pattern generation. Then uh, here's another very common one, the Galvo scanner. So Galvo scanner just has two independent motors. Um, these are mounted inside these brackets. So, so there's, there's one motor here, basically, and then there's another motor here. And each motor, uh, basically, uh, a mirror is mounted uh, to, the, uh, to the output, um, you know, uh, output of the mirror, so you can pivot the two mirrors in, 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 in two axes. So you get two bounces. You have your input beam bounces off the first mirror and then bounces off the second mirror, and then you have your output scan uh, beam. So uh, one mirror basically controls the, the uh, azimuth angle of the outgoing beam, and the other mirror controls the elevation angle. And again, this is a highly, highly configurable uh, uh, you know, scanner, you can design different scan patterns for the, or different waveforms for the two mirrors that give you different output scan patterns. So these are uh, very attractive, for instance, in research applications um, because they don't lock you into a fixed scan pattern and you can also generate dynamically varying scan patterns and things like that, which is not the case for, uh, for instance, these rotating frame uh, scanners. And finally, you can have your polygon mirror scanner. So, so this one is, it, it is actually used uh, in in, in the industry quite a bit because it's cheap and robust, but not very configurable. So you have this polygon where the output uh, faces are mirrors, and uh, it rotates at some angular velocity. So um, um, uh, you have this input beam, and then the output beam, um, as, as the polygon rotates, it's going to just scan in one direction. So this gives you a 1D scanning. It just does say. Um, azimuth, for instance. Uh, you can use two of them uh, to, do, to do more than one, but typically you just get a one axis of scanning. Okay, questions? Yes? Were the first rotating frame, so those are typically spinning. Like, I don't know how fast they're spinning, but are you like sending and receiving as it's like spinning like that fast? You just assume that it's happening? Yes, so the question is for these uh, rotating frame LIDARs, um, are we sending and receiving the signal as it's rotating? And the, the answer is yes. Um, so that's why part of the reason they can't rotate too fast is exactly because of that. Because um, if, if you scan too fast, um, Basically, by the time you receive the echo back from the target, especially if it's a far target, you have rotated so much that the, the, the echo that returns might not align with your detector anymore, and that reduces your SNR significantly. So typically, SNR, one of the factors that determines the SNR of these devices is how fast they spin, okay? But uh, kind of related to that, that's kind of the case for any scanning mechanism. So even like with the Galvo scanner, uh, if you scan your mirrors too fast, I mean, it's the same thing. You send out a beam, and then it hits a target. So the echo that comes back, by the time it comes back, if your mirror is pointing at a significantly different angle, you can collect that echo. So that's a general trade-off that you have for LIDARs, scanning LIDARs, which is regardless of your beam scanning technique, if you scan too fast, it's going, your SNR is going to start to drop. Do you have to do like anything special for like direction of arrival, or is it just like you know where you're sending it and you're probably yeah, Great question, and, and we'll talk a little more about this uh, towards the end of the chapter, but generally there's, generally speaking, there's no DSP because you know, like regardless of, again, whatever scanning mechanism you're using, um, you, you know, you model it, right? Some of them is, is easy, right? Like if you have, like for instance, for this one, where you just have one mirror and you know, uh, one reflection, just by, by knowing the angle the mirror is pointing to, um, you just know your direction of arrival, right? Some of them are slightly more complicated. So for instance, for this one, you have to have a model because what you, re what you know is like omega, omega 1 and omega 2, or the orientation of the two prisms at a given point in time. So you have to have you know, a function that maps that to the angle of the outgoing beam. But you generally assume that the angle you're pointing to, that's also your angle of arrival for, for, for LIDAR. Um, um, Galvo also, um, you need to kind of model it, because you get two reflections. 
and there is a very specific kind of distortion that can happen if you don't model you know, the GAVO geometry uh, correctly. Okay, so uh, next, uh, next topic is photo detection, uh, but let's quickly remind ourselves where we are. So uh, when we started talking about the LiDAR physics, this is basically the picture we had. So, so far we have learned about laser sources. Uh, we have learned about basically these Gaussian beams that, that come out of the source. We've talked about uh, TX optics or lenses that basically uh, collimate a fastly diverging beam to a nice, nice collimated beam that can travel hundreds of meters, right? Uh, we have also talked about beam scanning techniques, so that's also done. Now we are going to start talking about photo detection, okay? So, uh, photo detection. What is photo detection? So generally speaking, photo detection is the process of absorbing photons of fly, uh, light and uh, transforming them into a detectable signal, okay? And a detectable signal can be different things uh, in different applications. It might be heat in some applications. It could be electrical current or voltage or, or other things, right? For LiDAR, uh, it's, it's basically electrical current. Uh, that's that's uh, what, what we'll work with. So we want uh, devices that can absorb these photons that are reflected from the targets and convert them to electric current because uh, then we can use all the you know, uh, good techniques that we have developed in electronics. We can convert current to voltage, feed the voltage to an analog to digital converter, and then you know, do signal processing on it. But generally speaking, there's, there's different types of photo detection phenomena that can happen. Uh, you can have biological photo detection. That's, for instance, what happens in our eyes. Uh, the photons are absorbed, and then it goes through a complex sequence of, of chemical reactions and eventually produces a signal in a nervous system, for instance. That's one type of photo detection. You can have thermal photo detection, where photons are uh, absorbed and they are transformed to, into heat. So devices like thermistors, for instance, do that. Uh, you can have photoacoustic uh, uh, detection, pretty interesting phenomena where uh, photons are absorbed and they're transformed into sound waves directly. Uh, that, that, that can happen, um, very interesting. Uh, and, uh, and finally, you can have the photoelectric effect, which is the one, again, that uh, LIDARs use for sensing. And that's where they absorb photons, essentially free up electrons that generate an electric current inside a device, and then this current is eventually uh, converted to a voltage that is used for sensing. Okay, so we are going to focus uh, on the photoelectric effect and study the physics of devices that are that are used. Specifically, semiconductor uh, photoelectric detectors is is what is used uh, widely used in lidars. Okay, so there are. When it comes to photo detectors, in short, we are going to call them PDs. Uh, there is there is two main characteristics that are very important for sensing uh, for these devices. One is called the responsivity of the device, and the responsivity is basically a measure of how efficiently the photo detector conver converts elect uh, photons to electrons. Okay, or optical input to electrical output. That's that's a measure of efficiency. Okay, so that's number one, that is very important. And obviously we want responsivity as high as possible, right? We want the device to be as efficient as possible. And then there's a the notion of bandwidth. And bandwidth is basically determines how fast the device responds or, or, or how quickly it can respond to a change in optical input, okay? Now when it comes to bandwidth, um, the bandwidth is a parameter you need to optimize to get the best uh, uh, sensing performance. And what I mean by optimizing is that the bandwidth needs to be matched to the, the, the characteristics of the, the signal waveforms that you send out. Right? Uh, you, want it, you want to have enough bandwidth that you can make sure you would capture whatever waveform that you sent, okay? But if you have more than that, if you have excess bandwidth, that's not necessarily a good thing because that means there is just some additional noise that can make it into your signal and reduce SNR, okay? So responsivity, we want it high, but bandwidth, we want it optimized. I'm just gonna put a star there for, for optimized. Okay, and we're gonna talk about both of these, but we'll start with the physics of the device and the, and the responsivity. Uh, 
Uh, again, there's lots of different photo detection mechanisms, and for each mechanism, there's different devices that you know operate based on that that mechanism. But specifically for for lidar, uh, the type of photo detectors that uh, are used are called the uh, the PIN semiconductor photodiode. Okay, so what is this device? Uh, uh, this device is actually it, it's a diode. Okay, if you're if you're familiar uh, uh, with 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 diode, so so it's just uh, uh, from if if you want to just you know reduce it to a component electrical component, it's actually a diode. Uh, so it has a a, a a positive terminal and a negative terminal, an anode and a cathode. Okay. But you might know generally diodes, um, they're, used of, uh, they're, they're made of two types of semiconductors, a p-type uh, and an n-type semiconductor. What, what, are, what is a p-type and an n-type? So a p-type semiconductor is a semiconductor that is doped with uh, additional atoms which has excess positive charge carriers. Okay, so this is the p-type which has you know, excess uh, positive charges. And an n-type semiconductor is a semiconductor material that is doped with some other uh, material that has excess negative charge carriers or electrons. So this is, this is our n-type, which has excess negative charges. Okay? So, so if you just put a p and an n-type semiconductor together, you get a regular diode, which has its own applications. For instance, rectification, it's used a lot in power electronics. But that is not useful for photo detection. The magic happens when you add a third material, which is called the intrinsic uh, 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 material. And the intrinsic material is just some undoped uh, semiconductor, a third material that you kind of sandwich in between. And uh, that part of the device is called, also called the depletion region, okay? because it's depleted of, it's naturally depleted of charge carriers. It, it, it's not doped. Okay? And uh, what happens if, if, if you choose you know, the right, right materials and make a PIN diode, it's a still a diode, but it's a very special type of diode that in addition to the, 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 the regular ele electrical characteristics of the diode, it also can do uh, uh, photo conversion for you uh, via the photoelectric effect. So what happens is that if there's some incident photons uh, on, the, on the depletion region of the device, um, if the photons are of the right energy, and by right energy I mean if the energy of the photons, which is given by H times F, H remember is the Planck's constant and F is the frequency of, of, of the photons. If it's bigger than or equal to some delta E, which is called the band gap energy of this semiconductor material in the intrinsic region, and that's a property of the material. Every material has some, uh, every semiconductor has some uh, intrinsic band gap. So photons that have energy that is bigger than or equal to that can get absorbed and create electron hole pairs. So one photon gets absorbed and it generates a positive charge carrier and a negative charge carrier. Okay. And then what happens is that um, inside the intrinsic region, there is this electric field which is generated because you have accumulation of positive charges on one side and negative charges on the other side. So this electric field basically uh, sweeps away the electron hole pair that are generated. And as a result, you get a photo current inside the device. Okay. So again, a photon uh, enters the depletion region or the, or the uh, photosensitive region of the device. And if it's of the right energy, it can generate a electron hole pair, and then the electric field that is inside this intrinsic region basically sweeps them in, in opposite directions. Uh, basically, the electron goes to the anode side, the, 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 the uh, hole goes to the cathode side, and that means you generate a photocurrent inside the device. So, so that's how, um, basically, at the physics level, uh, this, this device, device works. Uh, First important characteristic of the device is how, what's the efficiency of this conversion of photons to electrons, right, through this uh, uh, um, basically um, effect that we just, just described. Uh, not, yes? So on the previous slide, uh -huh. they said the holes are going to the left. Um, can, you, can you explain why they're like why the plus and the minuses are going up in those directions. 
Uh, because because that's a direction. So it's determined by the direction of the electric field, right? So so here here see like the inside the region, uh, the depletion region. You have this electric field that goes in this direction, okay? And then the force that is applied. If you have a positive charge, it's going to get swept this way. If you have a negative charge, it's going to get swept in the opposite direction. So is the electric field caused the, the battery that you, the voltage? That will affect it, right? Uh, especially, we'll talk more about that. So that's the bias voltage that you apply will affect uh, the electric field. But it turns out that even if I disconnect the battery, okay, I need to close the circuit to, to use the signals. But even without that, there is some intrinsic field that is always present inside the depletion region. And that's because of this diffusion effect that you know, some of the negative charges you know, get, get diffused and, and accumulate at the, at the border of the P uh, side. And some positive charges you know, diffuse and get accumulated. That's actually how the intrinsic region works. You, know, you get you know, this, this carrier diffusion effect. And there is some surface positive charge on, on, the, on, the, on the cathode side, and there's some surface negative charge on the anode side. And those charges create this intrinsic electric field um, that is, that is always, always present, and it goes positive to negative. But if you apply an external bias voltage, it, will, it can reinforce that field or reduce it, depending on whether your bias voltage is positive or negative. So I guess like well, um, I guess like what, why, why would you apply a bias? Just like uh, we'll get to that. It's uh, yeah. Well, why, why do we apply the bias? That's hopefully we can cover it today. But that's a great question. Why bias? Um, and 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 do we want positive bias, negative bias, or what? Okay. So first thing is 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 this idea of the efficiency of the device, which is. Uh, basically, it's called quantum efficiency, fancy term, but all, all that uh, basically captures is um, the ratio of the uh, electron flux that you get generated inside the device to the photon uh, flux that is incident on the depletion region um, or the photo, photosensitive region of the device. It's called eta sub q, so it's basically the ratio of electrons per second that are generated to the photons per second that are incident on the device. Now, there's three factors that affect the, this, this efficiency, right? First one is not every photon that is incident actually makes its way into the intrinsic region. Some of them just get, as, as you see here, some of them just get reflected away, OK? So if you have some surface reflectivity, uh, call that R of the device, 1 minus R is the, is the ratio or percentage of the, num the photons that actually make their way into the photosensitive region, OK? Now, once they're inside, they need to get absorbed, because um, some of them also would just pass right through without getting absorbed. And those also don't contribute to the, to the uh, photocurrent. There's two factors that determine um, the, this, this absorption coefficient, what, what, uh, this absorption effect, basically. One is alpha, which is the photon absorption coefficient. And that's a property of the material. I'll show you some curves, but there's like for every given material at every, or every given semiconductor at every given wavelength, there is some intrinsic you know, absorption coefficient. There's also uh, how deep the depletion region is. So D is basically this uh, depth of the device. Of course, if more depth means there's more time for the electrons, uh, for the photons to get absorbed as, the, uh, as they're going uh, through the device. Okay? So you put these two together, and the ratio of the photons that get absorbed, you can quantify that by 1 minus e to the minus alpha d. Right? So for instance, if your alpha is 0, uh, means no absorption coefficient, like no intrinsic absorption, this term just becomes 1 minus 1, which is 0. So that makes a useless. Uh, of course, uh, uh, PI and photodiode, uh, but the, the larger al the alpha is, or the larger D is, that makes uh, this term closer to one. Okay. Uh, finally, the third effect, which affects the efficiency, is the fact that not every electron hole pair. So after a photon is absorbed and it generates an electron hole pair, not all of them are swept away and contribute to the photocurrent. Some of them, just after they get created, they just recombine back. Uh, and get get basically 
uh, destroyed. Uh, so the fraction, so this uh, psi uh, is the fraction of electron hole pairs that do not recombine and get swept away and contribute to the, to the photocurrent. So that's the third term. You just multiply I all three and that gives you your total quantum efficiency. So one minus reflectivity, surface reflectivity times uh, psi times the absorption uh, ratio and that's the total number of electrons per second to photons per second that you get. Okay. Now, uh, as I said, this absorption coefficient alpha is a function of the semiconductor material and wavelength. So you have curves basically for absorption coefficient, say in, in one, one over centimeter, as a function of wavelength for different materials. So different materials are shown in different colors. And then you can, um, you know, say you want uh, to build a LiDAR at 1550 nanometers, and then you look at the curves, and what are the choices? Germanium is a good choice. Even better is indium gallium arsenide. Okay, or you want to build a, a LiDAR at 905, what choices do we have? Uh, you could use silicon, not the, 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 the most efficient, but it, it works. You can use indium phosphide, or even better, you can use indium gallium arsenide. Okay, and there's of course different, silicon is cheap, so that's why it's used a lot, um, but um, uh, in gas is a more expensive exotic material, but more efficient. Um, We'll see in the next chapter when we talk about cameras. So camera wavelengths are, are down here, right? So they're like 400. Actually, they're even further down. Uh, so not even shown here, but it's, it's from 0.4 uh, microns to 0.7. So that's visible light. And for visible light, which is here, uh, you would see silicon becomes pretty good at those wavelengths. So that's why. Um, the, the, the image sensors in, in, in visible light cameras, most of them are, are, are made in silicon because it's, it's, it's cheap and pretty good at those wavelengths. Okay, so uh, closely related to the quantum efficiency uh, is, uh, because quantum efficiency relates electrons per second to photons, so electron flux to photon flux, right? Electrons per second, photons per second. Those are not natural units to work with. We don't want to like count electrons or count photons. We like to work with currents and power, right? Those are more, you know, uh, 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 intuitive parameters to work with. So there's this little conversion you can do to relate quantum efficiency to what is called the responsivity of the photodiode. What the responsivity is, is assume some photon flux phi, so that's the number of photons per second that is incident on the photodiode. Uh, what is the power of that photon flux? So power is the energy of the photons times the flux. Again, energy is Planck's constant times the, the frequency, and frequency Remember, it's speed of light over lambda. So that's the total power that's incident on the device. And what is the current that you get uh, out of the device? The current is just the electric charge E times the uh, electron flux, okay? So I sub P, which is the photocurrent, you can write it as uh, the quantum efficiency times the elementary charge, the charge of the electron, times the photon flux. Okay, so uh, again, uh, this uh, photon flux times eta, that gives you the electron flux, and electron flux times E gives you the electric current in amps. Okay, now in terms of the optical power, this becomes the expression. So, you're, so here you have your current in amps, and this is power in watts, of optical power in watts. Okay, uh, it becomes eta times E over HF times P. That's the relationship between electrical uh, photocurrent in amps and optical power in watts. Um, responsivity R is defined as uh, basically the ratio of the photocurrent to the incident optical power, I sub P over P, uh, which becomes equal to your quantum efficiency times the charge of the electron divided by Planck's constant times the frequency of the incident light. Um, you can write this in terms of wavelength using this equation here, relates frequency to wavelength. And in terms of the wavelength, you get this very famous equation for uh, responsivity. So it becomes your uh, quantum efficiency times the wavelength divided by some constant, one over two. 2.4. So this is R, and um, we are slightly overloading R uh, in our notation. We, we used R for reflectivity previously. This, this is the responsivity, and it's in amps per watt, right? 
how many amps of current you get out of the photodiode uh, for every watt of incident optical power. Interesting thing is that, of course, the higher the quantum efficiency, the better, okay? Uh, you can get pretty close to one with modern devices in quantum efficiency. Um, but also, interestingly, it goes up linearly with lambda. So higher wavelength gives you higher responsivity, uh, typically. Um, let's look at some responsivity curves, again, for different materials. Uh, so here we are comparing silicon and indium gallium arsenide, okay? But this time we are looking at the full responsivity of the device in amps per watt. Okay. Again, as we said, at 1550, N-gas is the material of choice. It can get responsivity uh, on the order of 1, roughly, amps per watt. That's a nice high number. And uh, silicon is, is a slightly lower, but it's, it's, it's pretty useful at you know, visible light. Even at, at, at 905, um, you know, silicon and ingas, in terms of the responsivity there, they're pretty close. So that's why silicon is used in uh, 905 nanometer uh, LIDARs also. Uh, interesting thing here is this linear trend, right? So we just said that that responsivity goes up with wavelength that you kind of see it in, in these two curves. Uh, why does the curve for each material drop outside a specific band? Um, because uh, as we said, for the photons to get absorbed, the energy of the photons needs to be close to the band gap energy of that material, the, the delta E, right? Um, so, so, so this is basically, for instance, the, the, the uh, wavelengths which makes the photons absorbable by N gas because they're you know close to the band gap energy and if you're much more or much less than that the, the material just cannot absorb uh, efficiently those those photons and that's why the responsivity starts to drop okay any questions all right so we talked about a uh, responsivity uh, here's uh, how these devices are fabricated in silicon, pretty simple fabrication. So you have a cathode, which is just you know a, a, a solid uh, uh, electric um, plate, basically. Uh, you have your n-type semiconductor deposited. Then you deposit your intrinsic material, which is the photosensitive region. Uh, then you have a, a p-type material in kind of like a well-like manner deposited at the top. Um, you need a second electrode to make the anode. So those are. Uh, kind of constructed like a frame uh, around the, the, the p-type uh, semiconductor. And then you, ha you need some aperture opening because light needs to get into the intrinsic region. So that's, that's basically uh, this purple looking material. That's a anti-reflection coating. Why do we put anti-reflection coating? Because we just said to improve a quantum efficiency. If, if you apply anti-reflection coating, uh, you, you, you reduce the percentage of the photons that get reflected out, and more of them make their ways into the intrinsic region, uh, which is, helps quantum efficiency and the responsivity of the device. So, so that's why anti-reflection coating uh, is applied. And here you see uh, two silicon uh, PIN photodiodes that are constructed, and these have pretty large apertures, as you see in the pictures, uh, kind of big. Um, so simple construction, and that's why these devices are kind of like cheap and, 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 and reliable. OK. Next thing we need to talk about is this idea of dark current. And what dark current is is that um, it's kind of a, a quantum mechanical effect, so we can't quite get into the physics of it. But it turns out that uh, except if you uh, hold your device at absolute zero temperature, which practically is not possible, there's always going to be some current following through the photodiode, even when there's no incident light. So even in the absence of incident light, there's going to be some small current going through the device. And that is called the dark current. Uh, so this dark current essentially becomes like a noise source for uh, photo sensing, right? Because there is some current that even, even when there's no light, it, it, it actually uh, is present. And uh, so given a photodiode with, with some dark current, uh, I sub S, uh, the minimum optical power that, that you can detect with the device, P min, is typically taken 
sigma by the power that corresponds to a photocurrent that is at least equal to the dark current. Because the idea here is that if, if the incident power is so low, such that the corresponding photocurrent is lower than the dark current, it's kind of like you're below noise floor and, and, and not, not detectable. So you can just do the simple math. What is IP min? That's just the incident power minimum times the responsivity of your photodiode. And if you want that to be equal, at least, well, technically you want to be bigger than or equal, but the minimum level is when you are equal to your dark current, that limits, sets a limit on your minimum detectable optical power, which is the dark current divided by the responsivity of your device. Now, for good devices, the dark currents are, are, are very, very small. I mean, they can be like um, sub microamp or even like nanoamp or in really, really, really good devices like picoamp level. Um, but, um, but that essentially sets, sets a bound on, on, on the smallest optical power you can detect. OK, so we talked about the responsivity of devices. But we also said when it comes to photo detection, the bandwidth of the device also matters. And that's how fast it responds to optical inputs. So uh, bandwidth of the device is very closely related to this idea of the response time of the device. So let's look at the pictures down here. Here we are having a uh, step-like change in the incident photon flux onto a photo detector. So it's at some you know, low level, and at some time zero, it just jumps to uh, higher level, that's photon flux. And then if you look at the response of the device, and the response can be, you know, the change in the, in the, in the photocurrent, or if you convert the photocurrent to the voltage, the change in the voltage. But the electrical response that you get out of your PD, it's not going to be like a step. It's, it's always a smoother function. So in this case, the device is going to take some time, which is called the response time, to say go from uh, zero to 90% of its final value, OK? And that's, that's TR. Uh, and when it comes to the response time, there's two effects that determine the response time of, of the device. One is the, called the charge carrier transit time. So that means basically how, how long does it take for, this, for an average electron hole pair that is generated inside the intrinsic region to be swept away and, and generate some current. Um, now, transit times are extremely fast for these devices because they just need to travel, you know, uh, um, um, a, a, a sub-micron, you know, distances. So typically, transit time is very fast. And what really determines the response time, T sub R, of the device turns out to be the RC time constant of the photodiode. Uh, what is RC time constant? So typically, you have some external readout circuitry. We'll talk about that more. And R is the resistance of that readout circuitry. So now we are even triply overloading our R. We, we, today we've used R for three different things, for reflectivity, for responsivity, and now for resistance. Hopefully by context is clear which it's referring to. Um, so, so R is the uh, readout circuitry resistance in ohms. And C is the photodiode junction capacitance. Because if you look at the construction of the photodiode, and we'll look at it in more detail in the next slide, it, it, well, it's a diode, but it also has some junction capacitance because it has two parallel plates with charges built up on them. So as, as you, you know from elementary circuit theory, when you have an RC circuit, the time constant of that circuit, which is how fast it responds to changes at the input, is determined by R times C. So your response time of your photodiode is proportional to R times C, which means the bandwidth of the device, which is the inverse of the, 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 the response time, is proportional to 1 over RC. So if you want faster devices, you need to decrease R or decrease C or both. Okay, uh, C is uh, basically intrinsic uh, to the junction construction. Uh, so by, by, by changing the geometry of the, of the PIN uh, photodiode, you can actually affect C, as, 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 as we'll see. And that is typically a technique that is not. So let's look at the junction capacitance of a PIN photodiode. As we said, this is the device construction. And you have two electrodes, right? 
positive and negative with some charge buildup. So that makes a parallel plate capacitor. What is the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor? As we know, it's epsilon zero times epsilon r. Epsilon r is the relative uh, uh, permittivity of the semiconductor material, okay? Uh, times a, a is the cross-sectional area of the device, right? So it's basically in this picture, it's the area in and out of the plane. That's the area of the plates of this parallel plate capacitor divided by the separation of the two plates, which is the, uh, the width of the device, W. Okay, so that determines your junction capacitance. And if we can somehow lower C, that improves the bandwidth of the device, makes the device faster. So of course, as you uh, fabricate a device, you can control materials and geometry, and uh, that's one way of, of uh, you know, by design reducing C. But if you're given a photodiode, which is already fabricated, you don't have control over A um, or epsilon, but it turns out, interestingly, you do have some control over W. And it's uh, back to Sarah's question, that's one place where this bias voltage, V sub D, that you apply externally to the device becomes important. Because um, bias voltage is, is uh, you know, the external circuitry that is, this device is part of always you know, applies some bias voltage uh, to it. But it turns out that uh, if this bias voltage is, is chosen to be negative, okay, if it's chosen to be negative, uh, what, what it will do is that it will reinforce this electric field inside the, the depletion region, okay? And by increasing that E field, uh, uh, basically it will increase the depletion region's width because you get more carrier diffusion, right? So you get, you know, more, more uh, of, of, of the carriers diffusing to the two sides and it kind of stretches the width of the device. Um, by applying that negative external bias voltage. So W goes up if, if you're, uh, you're reverse biasing your device, which means the junction capacitance goes down, and that helps the bandwidth of the device. So that's the first reason why reverse biasing, essentially a PIN photodiode, is a good thing, because it helps bandwidth. Now, it turns out that there's a second reason which is much, much more important uh, why you, you would want to uh, reverse bias a, 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 a PIN diode. And to understand that, we need to look at the complete voltage current characteristic of this device. So remember, we started with saying this PIN devices are diodes, right? There are special types of diodes that are sensitive to incident optical power and generate photocurrents, but there are still diodes. And as you know, every diode, uh, the, it has a exponential relationship between the current that goes through it and a voltage that is applied to its terminals. So a regular diode, if you remember uh, from your electronics course, uh, the, the voltage current relationship is, well, ignore this term for now, is given by this exponential function, which is I sub D is the current that is, goes through the device, and V sub D is the voltage applied to the two terminals of the diode. Okay, so, so you have some uh, uh, V sub D applied, and then there's some I sub D going through the device, and um, regular diodes have this relationship, which is this constant Is, which in this case turns out to be the dark current, times e to the uh, magnitude of the elementary charge times V sub D divided by K sub B is the Boltzmann constant, given by this number here, times the absolute temperature minus one, okay? So that's just the diode effect there. Now for PIN diodes, because they're special, they have this additional term, which is the photocurrent. And that's due to all the physics that we just talked about. So for a PIN diode, the full IV characteristic or the behavior of the device is essentially the, the sum of the two effects. You have you know, the normal diode current plus the photocurrent. Uh, well, why is the plus actually a minus here? Because uh, uh, the minus in front of the IP is because the photocurrent, as we saw, uh, flows from uh, the N terminal to the P terminal, 
But the convention for electrical currents is that uh, it flows from P to N. So ID is always taken in this direction, but we saw that IP actually flows in the opposite direction, so that's why we put the, we put the minus sign there. Okay, so uh, what we are actually, let me clean this up, got a bit too messy. Uh, so what we are really interested in for sensing is just IP, the photocurrent. All the, this stuff is just, you know, noise or interference for us that we are not interested in. Okay? But by the physics of the device, because it's a diode, it's there. Okay? So if you want to limit or eliminate this term, the only option we have, if you look at this exponential, is that if we choose a negative value for VD, you can make this exponential term almost vanish by reverse biasing uh, your basically uh, uh, PIN diode and make your total current uh, be completely dominated by the photocurrent, and that makes a very good, you know, uh, uh, photo detector. Um, so here's graphically uh, uh, how the IV characteristics of the device uh, work. So you have mul we have multiple curves here. Each of these blue curves is for a different value of incident optical power on the device. So the, the, this, this top one is where there's no optical incident power. You get your IV curve. And then as you increase your photon flux, you get different curves. Now it's broken into three regions. There's the forward bias or the photovoltaic regime. And that's where your VD, the, you know, the bias voltage of the device is positive, and you get this exponential behavior, right? Those, that's where you, the exponential term dominates. And it's, it's extremely difficult to do sensing in this region because, again, your behavior is what, if, what we sense out of the device is this current, and it's dominated by this exponential behavior in the forward bias regime. But if you look at the reverse bias or the photoconductive regime, the exponential term basically becomes negligible, and something very interesting happens. The, the actual current that you get out of the device, it's almost with incident photon flux. So it's basically a perfect linear sensor in, in that regime, and that's why you want to apply a reverse bias voltage. Uh, however, if, if you make your bias voltage too negative and hit the, the so-called breakdown voltage of the device, you can suddenly get a giant you know, inrush, inrush of current that, that uh, makes it again nonlinear. So, so this is essentially the most linear part. Uh, and, and then in the so-called Geiger regime, um, you can get nonlinear behavior out of, the, out of the device. I think this is a good place to stop. We'll, we'll uh, continue the discussion uh, next time. Any questions? Okay, see you next time.